All right. Thank you for joining us today. This is uh, the weekly water cool chat, water cooler chat, I should say. And we have a guest speaker today, as well as all the people in chat with us uh, going to be uh, doing some Q&A and a speech. Uh, today, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Jaron is from Miss Server, and uh, he was the founder of a company called DDV Tech. Uh, he founded, uh, him and his partners founded it about 12 years ago, and they created a product called Miss Server. Uh, Miss Server is a leading internet toolkit uh, that is open source and available for the public. Uh, Jerome was the CTO uh, up until the acquisition of LivePeer, and now he has the spot as VP of Engineering uh, with LivePeer. So I would like to now welcome uh, Jerome uh, to the call. And I figured I would turn on my camera. Hi there. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing today? No problem. I'm doing all right. How are you yourself doing and all you guys? Doing very well. Thank you. Um, so, Jaron, I'd like to just start off with a few questions uh, just to get started and get the ball rolling. The first question I have is, what is Miss Server and what does it aim? What is the problem it is trying to solve? So uh, to put it in layman's terms, uh, Miss Server is a media toolkit, so something that helps other developers build things, uh, that allows you to do media-related tasks without knowing anything about media itself. So if you wanted to set up your own streaming server, you know your own competitor to Twitch or to YouTube or something like that, Miss Server would be the tool that you could use to do that if you were only a web developer and had no further media knowledge. It would put in those parts that you would need to complete the project from the knowledge you already have. And the main thing it tries to accomplish besides making these things easy for people that don't know about media, because media is a rabbit hole that you don't want to fall into unless you know, you're know you going to make that your career. Um, the, the main thing we try to accomplish is that uh, Miss Server is a tool that focuses on a thing called transmuxing. And transmuxing is the opposite of transcoding in a way, or the inverse, I would say. Um, because instead of taking the data and modifying it and making it a different type of encoding, like what transcoding actually does, it takes the data, keeps it as is, but only repackages it in a new way and passes it on to a different point. So you can think of it as like the octopus in the middle handling everything and passing things back and forth without actually co changing the contents. Very Makes good. Makes sense? I I think so. Yeah, we uh, transmixing was a was a new term that I learned uh, after speaking with you. I think last week, and uh, the live peer community is really is really familiar with the word transcoding, um, and transcoding is simply just taking that bit rate from from a larger bit rate and breaking it down into you know smaller bit rates and and distributing that, um, you know, and 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 this server, from my understanding, is all about transmixing. So, how how does Miss Server fit in with live peer? How, how does that connect and how do you see that growing? Well, as I mentioned just now, uh, transmuxing, just to make sure it's mux with a U, not mix with an I. Uh, but uh, transmuxing is kind of the inverse of transcoding. So where LivePeer helps the open video and, uh, infrastructure by offering transcoding to the world at large, what Miss Server adds to that equation is the ability to also take that transcoded data and repackage it in ways that are practically useful for real world applications. So it's kind of like the, the beginning and the end that goes before and after transcoding happens. Right, yeah, very good. Um, you said that uh, transmixing is is like the inverse. Um, is Does Miss Server already do transcoding or is it just directly, um, like what, what, what has been the, the history of, of Miss Server and LivePeer uh, working together? Well, uh, it started a couple of years ago, I think literally two, but I might be off by that by a few months, where uh, LifePeer was looking for solutions to help provide their service. So as you know, they have the public network, which is you know owned by everyone and, and ran by everyone effectively. But they also have LifePeer.com, their hosted service that uses the public network. And to make that actually work, they needed infrastructure that that's takes in streams in formats that don't go into the public network directly. And then that sets them up for transcoding, sends them back, makes them available somewhere else again, maybe forwards them to YouTube, that kind of stuff, right? 
And MISSURFER is the tool that they use to build that implementation. Um, a fun fact is that LifePeer is actually the, the biggest user of MISSURFER right now. Uh, there used to be a bigger one, but they surpassed them a while ago, uh, with the most instances running around the world. So it kind of made sense for them to be interested in MISSURFER as, in terms of acquisition as well, because, well, they're so dependent on us, why not make, them, make us a part of them? Right? It just makes sense. Yeah. Definitely. Um, you know, as you've been in the, the video industry for a while, live streaming um, for for uh, over a decade, what what do you see as being the most important thing for an end user, right? Because this is all focused around end user experience. Where, what, what do you see as the most important thing and maybe where the future, you know, problems um, that these these services can can solve? Mm -hmm. So the main thing as an end user that you want is you want your video to just play and not stop, not stutter, not get blocky. It should just work, right? And you don't care how it happens. You don't care what it does to get there as long as it works. That's all an end user really cares about. So the main challenge with video delivery over the internet or uh, OTT, it's often called in the industry, which stands for over the top. And it's an old term that people that are on traditional networks use to discuss delivery that doesn't go over your good old coax cable, you know? But this just means internet streaming, just to simplify. <laughs> um, the, the main uh, challenge there is to make sure that that actually delivers right. And to do that delivery, there are many strategies. And one of them is to make sure that you do what's called ABR, adaptive bit rate. And that means that you have a stream available in multiple qualities from high to low. And people with a good connection can watch the high one, and people with a bad connection can watch the low one. Um, but it is not really as simple, because even if you have a great connection, maybe you have fiber somewhere, you can still have a bad connection to a particular server. And then you still fall back to that lower quality. So having multiple qualities available is part of the solution, but not the be-all and the end-all. And to make the whole thing work, you not only need those multiple bit rates. In fact, you can often skip the multiple bit rates if you do everything else right. But that does need to happen. And the everything else in this case is making sure that you are locally uh, near your users. So if you have a lot of users in a particular region of the world, make sure that you have um, a service running near them that can provide those users with the video data. Because the closer you are to your end users, the better the quality will be, regardless of uh, what kind of encoding you actually use. And if you combine that with adaptive bitrate, you get like a double whammy of making sure everything works smoothly for everyone everywhere. And you can kind of focus on particular areas where your target users are and at the same time provide decent service to people that are not there or that are on a really bad connection. Yeah. That kind of makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you, uh, you, know, you, you are familiar with, with the, the, the video stack more than I am and, and transcoding is, is, a, is a problem that was really, really a big deal uh, decades ago because of the slow internet speeds and as internet speeds increase um, what and and we have more more um, commercial grade um, you know hardware that can handle the, these types of tasks where do you see the future of transcoding is it gonna is it gonna end up be fizzled out into uh, something that every uh, device can do on its own or do you think there'll still be demand for it well, every device can do transcoding on its own. And that's been a thing for, well, probably that whole decade that I've worked in industry. Yet we still need dedicated transcoders. And that has a reason because most devices can do one, two, at most three transcodes simultaneously before they start to overheat, melt. You know, I'm not literally melting, I'm joking, but you know, uh, and do all kinds of bad things. Um, so why do we still need this? Well. You only really need to do one encode because like right now when we're in this video call, my laptop is doing one encode, sending my video to you guys. And it can handle that just fine. It's not even running the fence, right? That's all hardware accelerated. It could do two of these simultaneously as well. But let's say that everyone here had their video feed going. Let's say that we had nine feeds. I think, am I counting right? Yeah, nine feeds. Um, that's totally fine for decoding on most machines, but it's already getting a bit troublesome on many. But if you want to record this, say, uh, for, for like you're doing right now, you need to transcode that collection of screens. And that needs to happen at every point where you want to have a different view of things. And the same thing needs to happen if I am broadcasting 
testing, say, in 4K. I'm not right now. I mean, this camera is obviously crap. Uh, but let's say I were broadcasting in 4K. Most people would not be able to view that. So that would need to be transcoded somewhere. My laptop is not going to do a 4K stream and a 1080p stream and a 720p stream, etc. Right? It's not going to be able to handle that. So you will always need infrastructure somewhere that takes care of the things that the device that is generating the feed cannot handle. And that is a good place for transcoding to be used and why it will always be needed. And sure. over the years, I think it will probably move from the current codex, like H.264 is what everyone's watching right now, because it works literally everywhere. But I will think that in the next 10, 20, 30 years, we will move to a more modern codex and probably a more diverse set of codex. Because right now, H.264 is everything. But there are many codecs out there that are better and have been better for years and that are slowly, finally getting into more common use now. And I think that will be a big thing as well. Yeah, that, that's excellent. Yeah, it's good good to know. Yeah, just like this video call, it's being it's being transcoded, and so it's available for, for viewing for everybody. Um, you know, I just want to talk a little bit more about the back end of live peer as well, which is these, these NVIDIA GPUs we use. Um, do you see a place where... Um, you know, the, the NVIDIA GPUs are going to be used uh, for this. Do you think ASIC, like ASIC type hardware, could be utilized for transcoding or transmixing, I guess, into the future? And how do you see the hardware adjusting to these kind of demands? Yeah, for uh, transcoding specifically, hardware acceleration has always been a huge thing. For example, one of the newer video codecs, AV1, which is amazing in terms of how much quality it gets out of, uh, out of a single byte kind of thing. Uh, I think it is, uh, don't quote me on this because I'm literally pulling this from my memory somewhere, but I think it is like somewhere between a 40 to 60% improvement over H.264, which if you think about it, is a massive savings in terms of how much you have to store. Um, that codec, uh, when it came out, it required a cluster of 100 servers to transcode one stream in real time in 1080p. Now. Thankfully, they've optimized things a little bit since then. So now I think it goes at, what is it, 50 times slower than real time or 20 times slower than real time for those kind of loads, which is still sl snail space, right? You could never do this in real time with a single machine uh, yet. <laughs> but this particular codec was actually optimized from the start by the people that made it to be easily optimizable in hardware. So yes, you will see dedicated chips that can do AV1, it will most likely be included in future NVIDIA cards or ATI cards and even directly on CPUs. But I know that there are already today uh, external cards that you can purchase that will hardware accelerate transcoding for this particular codec. And the same will be true for pretty much any codec that wants to see popular use because without that hardware acceleration, doing things in real time is just not realistic. So um, will we be using NVIDIA GPUs in the future to transcode? Yes. Will it be the only thing we use? Hopefully not. Uh, and the fun thing is that the extra cores on video cards that are very good for video processing, processing, bleh, words, processing sorry, uh, they tend to actually be not very effective for transcoding. For example, doing H.264 uh, or, or H.265, uh, also known as HEVC, which are very common codecs today already, uh, on the, the calculating part of the video card, is almost, well, you can do it, but the speed up you get is almost nothing because most of the operations are not parallelizable. And video cards are really good about doing a, a ton of tiny little small calculations, but millions of them simultaneously. And they're not very good at doing one big calculation that's quite hard and slow and needs to happen with a lot of power behind it. That's more the regular CPU is good at. Or these hardware accelerated chips that NVIDIA cards have on board. That's why you can do the whole life pair thing where you can do you know, cryptocurrency mining, but at the same time also use the extra chips for transcoding without much of a performance hit because they're literally different chips on the same hardware. Definitely. Uh, it, very interesting. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting to see where the, where the advancements will come to, to specific, you know, have specific hardware and, and things that, that can solve these challenges. Um, that I'm gonna. So we, we talked a little bit about my server. We talked a little bit about Live Peer and its transcoding. I want to shift a little bit and uh, get your opinion on Web three. So Web three is this idea that we have, you know, the decentralized web, and um, Live Peer is going to be 
you know, is, is, is positioned to be the video infrastructure and, and transcoding service of this, this Web3. What is your opinion on Web3 and how do you see live streaming fitting into that? That's a really tricky question. I mean, my opinion is not tricky, um, but how to make it fit in, that's tricky. Uh, because uh, a lot of people associate the word Web3 with crypto related projects. And well, it's true that those are very important Web3 projects because they decentralize uh, keeping track of who owns what effectively. And whether that be money, some currency or particular assets, that's what it decentralizes. And it does that very well. Uh, but video, if you want to decentralize that, that's not just keeping track of who owns what. That is making sure that a large blob of data gets transported around the world to where people actually want to consume it in time, uh, every time, and without disturbance in the whole feed. And decentralizing that is a whole other can of beans, or whatever the expression is. <laughs> uh, for the record, I'm not a native English speaker. <laughs> yeah, no. um, Anyway, I would serve that was an actual expression or not. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's completely different, right? You have to solve completely different challenges because the problem is not so much keeping track of what uh, the, the source of truth is, which is, you know, for bookkeeping of who owns what, the most important thing. With video, you care not so much about that the video is identical to the original video. You care about that it looks the same. And if that's a completely different encoding or a different quality level, it can also be acceptable as a delivery as long as it's delivered smoothly and the user doesn't care about the quality that they are seeing. So you have to go with a completely different kind of decentralization there. I think it's more of a give and take in terms of I have bandwidth available uh, or and you need some so I can kind of offload what you're trying to do, that kind of thing. And it will be tricky to actually get that decentralization working properly, not so much because sharing via cross servers is hard, uh, I mean, it is, but the stuff that we've been building for the last decade makes it pretty easy. The problem is that how do you organize that, right? Uh, if if you have if two people have a video server, how do you get them to take feeds from each other and be able to trust each other that they are delivering that feed and not something else? How do I know that uh, I'm not getting something completely different when I'm watching that feed through your server? And that is the problem that we have to solve. And I have no easy answer for that right now. But I think it would be uh, a really, like if if anyone in the world is able to solve this, I think the combination of LifePeer and Miss Server has the know-how and the technical skills to make it happen, right? And I don't have the answers right now, but I think that if anyone's gonna solve it, it's probably gonna be us. And I'm very much looking forward to doing that together with the rest of the LifePeer team. Awesome. and the rest of the life peer community awesome yeah that is that is really um yes i do believe that uh if anyone can do it mist and live peer combined would make uh would make the uh the perfect match to to solve this problem so uh, we're off on a good foot so that, that's very good i'd like to now switch over to uh questions that that people have um, you know, if you've been watching, um, go ahead and unmute yourself and, um, we will, uh, do some Q and a for, um, for, uh, Jerome here today. So, uh, does anyone want to start off with a question they have about either miss server live here or anything video tech related? Yeah, uh, well, it's not really related to like the like the transcoding, like technicals, but like I wanted to know like that what what was the idea, like behind having orchestrators in and like the test testing servers in different areas where like as an orchestrator for me, I mean if if I don't like start like a virtual server somewhere else the only thing I'm going to be able to transcode is like locally. Uh, like I can't successfully in real time transcode um, something that's from like the USA because it would take like so long to get here and then I'd have to, my GP would have to transcode and send it back. Like what was the idea behind that? Like, uh, is it like one person will, of course will help start multiple or or orchestrators and then they will, uh, maybe join transcoders from different areas like what was the idea main idea behind like the having different 
test streams in different areas. Did well, you want... uh, I can speak for all of life of course, but I can give you a little bit of insight here, which is that, um, as I mentioned before, being local to where video wants to be consumed is super important. And the same is not just true for watching, but also for sending, receiving video in general. And when you're running a, a note somewhere that is going to take transcodes, it is just important that the source of that video is nearby and that it is going to somewhere nearby. And having localized, geographically spread out uh, availability of transcoding means that no matter where in the world you are, there will always be someone nearby that can handle that load properly. So you're not really supposed to spin up machines all around the world. You're supposed to handle where you are, and other people are supposed to handle where they are. And then, you know, as a, as a global community, we can handle everything. But I think you wanted to say something as well, right, uh, Theo? No, I was yeah. just going to say that is a, that's an interesting question, and uh, and I was just going to hand it straight over to you. So you answered it perfectly. So ah, thank, th thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. And I hope to clarify it a bit. Do feel free to uh, to ask a follow up question if you're not sure on something, or if you have follow up questions in general. Yeah. No. Yeah, I, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, if if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, because um, for me it's like the scores of uh, an orchestrator like depends heavily on like the global uh, latency and everything. So I was like wondering, I'm like, is Lightyear trying to, um, I don't know, like trying to ask uh, the people to have multiple orchestrators or something like that because. Uh, this, of course, like people will care about their scores. Like I care about my scores as like, I want to see like a hundred out of a hundred in every like test streams, because of course, like that looks great. And, um, the more better performance I have, I think I'll get better jobs, but that won't be possible without, of course, having different orchestrators in like different continent. So, you know what I mean? So yeah, it's yeah. like it sounds like uh, I'm not super familiar with this part of everything in terms of the stack because you know I'm relatively new to life itself, but more of a veteran in video in general. But it sounds like these tests are being run from specific geo geographic areas that are not necessarily close to you. Does that sound about right? Um, yeah, um, because I wanted to know like the performance part where like we're judged by our performance on like transcoding, if we're able to transcode live or not, and like what's our latency from different uh, locations. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm thinking like that, that, wouldn't that be better if it was locally where you are from? And then it wouldn't, yeah. well, it wouldn't matter much if it's like out, out outside of your region, but then, it, it, it's it, it's not working that way in life here so i was like wondering but i mean you're not like of course you're not like the person to ask about like everything but i just I, wanted to well, i don't know the technical the... reasons behind things yeah I, I'll, I'll step in no, here real quick i'll step in here real... I mean, I mean, uh... Uh, so yeah, ju yeah. just to mention on the on the global uh, orchestrator score um, that is just one metric. If you were to go to the performance board and use the drop down, you can check the different regions that you get your scores in. And so I would focus like if you're in North America, your North American score is going to be very high and you're going to be receiving streams from that area and transcoding in real time. Um, so the global score is just an indication, but um, I, I would definitely check the drop down menu of the different region you're in and focus on that one region first, because you'll see certain orchestrators get high scores in, in, um, in certain regions and low scores in other. And it just so happens uh, on the Live Peer Explorer, it has the global score as all of the sum of all of them as the front dashboard. Right, so I, I wouldn't use the global score as your performance because your performance is, is more based on your location. And so I would use that drop down and focus on that one area you are uh, located in. So yeah, just to clarify, you're not supposed to take streams for the entire world, right? You're supposed to be good in the area you're in. So what matters most is the score for you locally and not the score for the whole world. Theoretically, no one could have a great global score theoretically, uh, unless you're like in a data center probably. 
unless unless the way live peer works too is um uh which i've written an article about this is uh, geolocating dns and what it allows you to do is set up a server in each continent and have the streams rooted to the closest uh, server that you have right and so that that is one of the ways we get a really like tight node and some other people have implemented this and this is why we have really high global scores because we have nodes that are located in different continents and the streams get uh, routed yeah, yeah. to those server locations right so um, Jason, I would highly recommend you check out uh, the article I writ uh, written on how to do uh, geolocating DNS. Um, and then you can set up servers in different parts of the world. And that would be how you'd get your global score uh, much higher within LivePeer. Um, uh, awesome. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, Titan, for the geolocating that you have set up in the, those, those servers you're setting up, um, are you also like putting transcoders near those, or is it just the server? You're you're just putting your your orchestrator or the the server over in that area, and just using that to route the traffic from, say, like if you're going from Canada to London, your transcoders in in London, in Canada, and your orchestrators in London. Um, yeah. Or you have a transcoder in London. Yeah. If if that kind of question thing. is directed towards me, yes. The the way it's set up is um, I have like a uh, the orchestrator and transcoder on the same machine. And then I just run uh -huh. different instances of it in different uh, locations. So for for Titan node specifically right now, we have uh, one server in the Netherlands, one server in Canada, one server in the US. And so North America streams get divided up between Canada and the US uh, using weighted rules. Uh -huh. And then all European work goes to the Netherlands server. And that's all done through Route 53 with Amazon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Any other questions for Jerome? Great. I okay. think Mill is trying to ask a question, but his mic is not working, I think. Authority Null, do you have a question? Okay. Well, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Probably not working right. <laughs> no he worries. Might be back in a minute. Who knows? Yeah. Well, what what we'll do is um, uh, we will uh, we will wrap up the end of uh, just the, the the speech with uh, with uh, uh, Jerome. Thank you so much for coming on, Jerome. This has been a, a really a great introduction to Miss Server uh, and what what uh, the, the combination of Miss Server and Live Peer have together. And um, you know this is a is a new is a new chapter in Live Peer's ecosystem where we have this new tool, new developers, and new resources to really expand the uh, the idea of Live Peer being the you know the the decentralized world Web three infrastructure for video, right? And so um, it's really great to have you. And uh, yeah, thank you for taking the time of your day and, and joining us for this water cooler chat. No problem at all. All right. So Glad to be 